Okay, so we're gonna work with um, uh, statistics in this section in the sense that we wanna figure out how do we get statistics? Are they good, are they bad? Um, and that starts with collecting data. So if I were to ask you, if you text and drive, you know, I might not get uh, a real good set of data because it's pretty sensitive personal information. And a lot of times when we ask for a voluntary response, then your, your data that you get might not be all that good. Another way to think of that is uh, a self-selected sample. So self-selected sample. And a self-selected sample is a sample in which you let the respondents decide whether or not they want to be included. So let's the respondents decide if they want to be included. or not. And that's kind of a problem. So well, what's the problem? The problem is if you're allowing somebody to decide if they're gonna be in your survey or not, then that choice separates them from the rest of the group that they're part of. So for instance, web polls. So examples, web polls tend to be notoriously worthless as far as trying to understand what people feel. Because the people that answer these things are motivated one way or another. Either they liked the product or they didn't like it, or somehow they feel emotionally charged about an issue that they wanna respond. But that, not, that might not mean that they're representative of some group as a whole. So web polls, mail-in surveys, which I don't think anyone would bother doing those anymore, but um, how about text into a radio show? The results from these kind of polls aren't necessarily gonna be representative of anything other than the people who chose to respond. So you have to be kind of careful about where you get your data Another problem that you can get with data is bias response. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, um, <clears throat> let's just write down the problem is that this data might not be representative and you can't generalize the results. So it may not be representative. And you can't generalize the results. Okay. So we're gonna, try, we're gonna wanna avoid voluntary response or self-selected samples as much as we can. Because typically speaking, if you have you know, garbage data, no amount of statistical torture is gonna save that data. So well, let me uh, start in terms of at least a couple problems with something a little bit different. It's statistical significance. versus practical significance. So what is statistical significance? Well, let's see. I don't think I have that in my little definition sheets there for you. So statistical significance,
is an event resulting from something other than chance. So if it's unlikely that something occurred uh, just by chance, then we're gonna say it's statistically significant. Now, you can't always eliminate the possibility that something occurred by chance. So for us, the threshold is gonna be a less than 5% chance that it occurred just by a fluke or by luck. All right, that's gonna be our threshold. And you'll understand the reason for that cutoff a little bit later as we go through chapters uh, six, seven, eight, and beyond that. But for now, that's kind of like the cutoff between something that we can attribute to statistically significant versus, well, maybe it was just luck. Now, apart from statistical significance, there's also a practical significance. And practical significance means the result is meaningful compared to what might have been expected otherwise. So the result is meaningful compared to what might have been expected otherwise. So let's do a few examples on both of those. And for that, I'm going to turn to the book. Mm -hmm. And I think the homework for this is going to be on page like 10. Let me just double check here. Yeah, so it's going to be page, we'll start on page nine, but we're going to go to jump to page 10. And you should see something like this on page 10. Mm -hmm. And let me scroll down to problem number 14. So is that coming through here for you? Uh, everyone can see problem number 14 about the MCAT? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so the MCAT is what a lot of colleges use to help decide if they're going to admit you to med school or not. And we want to test the significance of, or the effectiveness of the Siena MCAT preparation course. In doing so, we're gonna have 16 students take the MCAT, so they completed the preparatory course, uh, and then retake the MCAT with the results that the average mean score for the group rises from 25 to 30 uh, on the MCAT. So the question is, there's a 0.3% chance of getting those results you know, by luck does the course appear to be effective? So I want to look at two things here. The first one is, is it statistically significant? So, well, do you think that you could achieve those kind of results just by luck? Well, you'd have to be really lucky. You'd have like a three in 1,000 uh, chance of getting those luck are getting those results just by luck, according to the particular problem here. It's telling us there's a 0.3% chance that you get those results simply by luck. So that's telling us it's statistically significant. But what about practically significant? Are the results meaningful? Would you pay three or $400 to boost your score from 25 to 30? Well, I'm not too familiar with the MCAT, but that looks like a 20% increase in your score. So, hmm, 
Is a 20% increase meaningful? Yes. I think so. 20% better? Yeah. Heck yeah. That sounds really good. So the results are statistically significant and practically significant. It's both. So if you're unsure of something, if you're like, well, that went a little bit fast, let me know. We can back up, we can uh, answer some more questions, or maybe I went through things a little bit too quickly so that you didn't quite catch something. Let me know, I'll be more than glad to help out here. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, so why is it um, practical significance again? Because, Jumping your score from a 25 to a 30, 30. Okay. Is, is a meaningful result. That's a 25, that's a 20% increase in your score. So, oh, oh, because if you're retaking it, you expect to do better. So, okay. Yeah, yeah you expect okay. to do better. And, you know, on average, they did a lot better, a 20% increase. Okay. So, that'd be like going from a 70 on a test to an 84%. You know, that's the kind of 20% increase you're talking about. And that's pretty significant, I would think. So, so are the results meaningful is a good way to, to think of it. And yeah, those are meaningful results. So thanks, Shalom. Uh, anything else on problem 14? Okay, let's take a look at problem number 16. Most people have IQ scores between 70 and 130. We'll learn later that that's about two standard deviations away from the mean, which is 100. For let's call it 40 bucks, you can purchase a PC or Mac program from High IQ Pro that is claimed to increase your IQ score by 10 to 20 points. The program claims to be the only proven IQ increasing software in the brain training market. But the author of this text could find no data supporting that claim. So let's suppose these results were obtained. In a study of 12 subjects using the program, the average increases in IQ score is three IQ points. And there's a 25% chance of getting those results if the program has no effect. So let's take a look at these one at a time. First of all, in terms of statistical significance, if there's a 25% chance that you've got these results by luck, is that a statistically significant result? No. No. Typically speaking, you want to prove your results beyond a reasonable doubt. And for us, that reasonable doubt is a 5% level. So because there's a 25% chance we could have got these results by luck, that means that we didn't meet that beyond a reasonable doubt kind of threshold. So this is not statistically significant. Uh, significant. Okay. But what about practically significant? Is it worth 40 bucks to you to raise your IQ three points? Mm, three points. I mean, the average IQ for people is supposed to be about 100. So if you went from 100 to 103, are you suddenly going to get into Harvard? No. Uh, I don't think so. No. Three points on a scale that is centered at 100 is not a big deal. It's just not. So it's not statistically significant, and it's not practically significant. So it's neither. It loses out on both ends. <clears throat> now, there's another example that I'll, I'll give you here that is kind of cool because it splits the difference a little bit. And we'll see this data later um, in the book. It's about the Atkins diet. And I can't remember the first guy's name. I think it's Charles Atkins. Anyways, he had this diet and uh, it's really popular for a while. Uh, and I'm sure they made a lot of money, probably still making a lot of money. Um, 
they put some people on this diet for an entire year. After the entire year, the average weight loss was a statistically significant three pounds. Hmm. But is that practically significant? Would you be happy being on a diet, spending lots of money to be on this program for a year and you lost three pounds? No. I got one vote for no. Anyone else? No. No. Two votes. No. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is kind of what I was hoping for. It's like, well, wait a minute. I mean, to be honest, you could change your weight by three pounds if you ate a really salty meal this evening. You know, you'd weigh three pounds more just by soaking up more water um, as, in, as part of your diet. I lost several times more than three pounds when I did a race a number of years ago. It was really hot, really long, and I lost a lot of weight uh, from one day to the next. So losing three pounds over a year is not practically significant. It might be statistically significant, but like I said, there's two parts of this. I mean, is it a worthwhile result? No, three pounds is not a big deal, not after a year. Okay, cool. Hmm. So, Another problem that you might run into with data is the source of the data. Now, this morning I was listening to the radio and they were talking about the possibility of opening up gyms. You know, people miss their workout routines, I get it. Um, and somebody threw out the statistic that, oh, well, if you're at a gym, there's a one in 42,000 chance that you'll get the COVID from somebody else in the gym. And I was kind of curious. Hmm. Wow, that doesn't seem like that much at all. But then my curiosity changed to suspicion when I found out that it was the gym owner who was professing that statistic. I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I became a little bit more concerned because in my way of thinking, um, that's kind of a biased source biased source. So that means that you have a source for your data that has a vested interest in the outcome. Um, says, when the source of your data has a if vested that just made me remember. interest mm -hmm in the outcome. So ideally, if you're conducting some research, you'd like to see that your data comes from some unbiased source. Has what? Has a what? Unbiased source. Unbiased source. would like an unbiased source. If you're conducting research on smoking, you don't want to get your data from the Tobacco Institute. It might not be you know, the most reliable. So let's take a look at a couple examples again in the book. And uh, let's see. Mm. So let me get over to page 11 here. Mm. So we're going to look at problems 25 and 28. So here's problem 25. This is in a poll sponsored by the Idaho Potato Commission, 1,000 adults were asked to select their favorite vegetables and the favorite of choice, the favorite choice of was potatoes, which were selected by 26% of the respondents. So, wow, 
neat coincidence, huh? The Potato Commission asks you to do the survey, and guess what? The favorite vegetable is potatoes, which are awesome, but what do you think? Um, is there a problem here? Yeah, it's bias. bias. Source. Yeah, I, I kind of regard that as a biased source. Uh, yeah, they probably have some vested interest in promoting potatoes. And if that's the healthiest one or the, the favorite choice, you know, that's good for them. How about down here with the uh, smokers in problem 28? The electronic cigarette maker V2 SIGS sponsored a poll showing that 55% of smokers surveyed say that they feel ostracized, sometimes, often, or always. What could be a problem with this study? You don't have to think too deep on this. Kind of, I don't know, it's very similar to the last one. I mean. They're trying to get you from smoking cigarettes to e-cigarettes. Yeah, it seems like they could have some kind of vested interest. They're like, they might be able to say, hey, look, you know, if you don't want to be ostracized, come over to our side. Because cigarette smokers, yeah, they get shunned a lot, all right? Can't go to bars and restaurants anymore. Eh. But e-cigarettes, hey, they're better. So, yeah, I, again, would be a little bit worried because this feels a little bit too close to, um, you know, to uh, the vested interest of uh, V2 SIGs, all right? I'd, I'd rather uh, a more unbiased source, hopefully like the CDC or something else. All right, <clears throat> there's one last little thing that we're gonna do, actually two last single things we're gonna do here. But are we okay with our conclusions for 25 and 28? Yep. Thank you. For the homework, if these are, are assigned, would you be okay with just us saying this is a biased source, they have a vested interest, or do you want more of an in-depth answer? Um, you know, let me put it in the terms of a test question. If I put this on a test question, then I just want you to say that you know, it's a biased source. So now the homework, I, I gotta be honest with you, I've not used my math lab much at all. And it's a big learning curve for me. It soaked up a lot of my time the end of the summer. So I don't know exactly what to expect from the homework, but what they do is they, they word the homework in such a way that they can randomize the problems and, and give you different and similar problems if you get it wrong one time versus the next time. So, uh, I don't know exactly what this would look like in the homework. I mean, I do select the problems, but like I said, there's a random component that I, I don't really get to experience because, you know, you have to pardon me, but I don't do the homework. <laughs> I think I, I kind of know what to expect here in terms of the types of questions I ask, but uh, I don't know what happens when you do the homework. So I apologize. Um, but on a test, you know, it'd be enough just to say, Look, uh, it's, a, it's a biased, uh, biased source. So does that help you out? Yep, thank you. Okay, cool, thank you. Now we're gonna do one last, uh, actually, you know what? No, I went the other way. I need to go to, uh, let's just see if I can jump up to page 12. Uh, we're gonna take a brief aside and do, <gasps> I'm sorry about this a little math. Um, and for that, we're gonna look at problem 32, chillax. Kinda of like that title. USA Today reported results from a research uh, now for Keurig survey in which 40, 1,458 men and 1,543 women were asked, in a typical week, how often do you kick back and relax? So, among the women, 19% responded with rarely, if ever. What's the exact value of 19% of the number surveyed, number of women surveyed? So let's see if we can't figure that out. Let's clear this out and this here. 
Now you don't necessarily have to have a, a graphing calculator for a problem like this. We're gonna start out with 19%. What's 19% as a decimal? 0.19. Thank you, 0.19. The word of means multiply, so 0.19 of, now the women were 1,543 women. So 19% of them would be 293.17, 293.17. Okay, that wasn't too hard, I'm hoping. But there's a couple more parts to this, so let's swing back here. Uh, could the results from part A be the actual number of women who responded with rarely, if ever? Why or why not? Could you have 293.17 women that said, yeah, rarely if ever chillax during the week? No, it's a decimal. Perfect, thank you. It's a decimal, it's just not gonna happen. You can't have a fraction of a woman responding yes or no to a poll like this. They have to be whole numbers. So what do you think the actual number is so part C says, what do you think the actual number of women who responded with rarely, if ever? 293. Yeah, I'd go 293. Now you can try some other ones and some other ones will be pretty close. If we do 294 divided by 1543, and if you want, I'll times by 100 to turn it into a percentage. Then that's 19.05, that would actually round to 19.1. Whereas if I do that again, um, this time let's just go to uh, 293, let's see where that puts us. This would actually round if you add one here, it would around to 19.0%. So, you know, likewise with 292, all those are pretty close, but the best answer I would think is 293. The big point of this though, is that you don't want a decimal answer. It can't be a decimal. So this number better be a whole number. Now you might lose a point uh, if you round it differently, if you did 294 or 292, um, but you certainly would get most of the credit if, if you gave me a, a nice integer answer close to this. Okay, part D. Among the men who responded, 219 responded rarely, if ever. Uh, what percentage of the men responded rarely, if ever? So let's take a look at part D. We got 219 out of 1,458. So let's just do that, 219 divided by 1458. Now you have two choices. You can either divide that and say, okay, about 15.0%. Or if you wanted to, you can multiply the result by 100 and just make it a little bit more clear that you're dealing with 15.0%. A lot of you I'm sure are gonna be most comfortable uh, just moving the decimal in your head, but it's fine. So now if I wanted to be very particular, I could say round your answer to the nearest 10th of a decimal, hundredth of a decimal, whatever. And where I actually care about that stuff, I'll put it in on the test saying, round your answer to this decimal place. <clears throat> okay, uh, how are we looking on that one? Good. Good, good. I think there was one last part here. So let me go back to that page. Considering the question that the subjects were asked, is the question clear and unambiguous so that all respondents will interpret the question in the same way? How might the survey be improved? So the second part is kind of hinting that, you know what, there is some issue with the first part. So let's take a look at the first part. Um, 
question. In a typical week, how often do you kick back and relax? So I guess one difficulty is your kick back and relax and my kick back and relax might mean way different things. So especially if you watch my little introduction to the prof video, you're going to find out that eh, my definition of relaxing might be different than a lot of people. Um, another problem is that in a typical week, well, now you're letting somebody free to roam and think about what their typical week is. My weeks are anything but typical. <laughs> so you might be better off asking them well, what happened in the last seven days. How did, you know, how often did you relax, chillax in the last seven days? That might be a better way to get an overall picture of things rather than just asking somebody to think about some fanciful typical week. That could vary a lot from one person to the next. But the last seven days is a nice definite period of time and you can think back very critically there. Whereas, you know, when you ask people to really dig back into things that happened years ago, uh, then you get what's called a recall bias. That is, people tend to recall things the way they like to think of them rather than the way they actually were. So there's gonna be problems in asking somebody to just recall a typical week. So there's a couple things that could be improved on that one. Hmm. All right, so I think we're good on that one. Um, the last one we wanna turn to is gonna be back on page, I think 10, maybe nine. Let me see here. I think it's gonna be nine. Yep, let's go back one more. It's gonna talk about the difference between correlation and causation. Now this problem is a little bit ahead of its time here for this course, because we are gonna spend a lot of time on correlation versus causation. And let me, uh, let me try and give you a little bit of a, a difference here between correlation and causation. Two things are correlated means when you increase one, you increase the other one. You increase the amount of time you study, you increase the, the grade you get on the exam. That's a nice correlation. What I also like to think that's a causation, that one causes the other. The extra study causes the higher grade. Let's think of a different example. Um, there's a correlation between how much TV people watch and how much they weigh. So, okay, the more people watch TV, the higher their weight tends to be. But is that correlation, just because you increase one, you increase the other, decrease one, you decrease the other, is that correlation also a causation? That is, does watching TV cause you to be overweight? No. So a correlation. So I got, a, I got one no vote. Um, other thoughts? Is it a causation? Does watching TV cause you to gain weight? Well, there could be different factors, so not, not directly. Yeah, not directly, no. So what happens is if you're watching a lot of TV, you're probably not moving that much. And if you're not moving that much expending calories, then it's gonna be easier to gain weight because you're gonna, it's gonna be easier to intake more calories than you burn. And when you intake more calories than you burn, that's when you gain weight. But watching TV in and of itself doesn't cause you to gain weight. It's related to other things, but it doesn't cause you to gain weight. So watching TV and your weight uh, are correlated, but it's not a causal relationship. Now, for the most part, we're going to save talk about correlation and causation until the end of the course, around Thanksgiving time. We're going to spend a whole afternoon whole evening, I suggest, uh, on correlation versus causation. And I'll have a special lecture for that. But right now, let's take a look at problem number four. Uh, so it says, one study showed that for a recent period of 11 years, there was a strong correlation or association is another word that's used for uh, correlation between the number of people who drowned in swimming pools 
and the amounts of power generated by nuclear power plants. Does this imply that increasing power from nuclear power plants uh, is the cause of more deaths in swimming pools? Why or why not? Hmm. So if we up the power output at Fermi 2, uh, down in southeastern Michigan, all of a sudden are we going to uh, experience a uh, spike in swimming pool deaths? Are those related? No. 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 Not directly, at least. Not directly. I, I think you'd have a hard time saying that there's an indirect relationship there, too. I mean, those things just feel totally different and independent of each other. Now, in a world of data, you know, you're going to find strange correlations, things that make no sense, like the number of bananas imported into England from Brazil and the birth rate in Canada, right? Strange correlations are going to exist when you look hard enough amongst a lot of data. But to say it's a causation is probably a stretch, all right? So it's something that I want to plant the seed of now, the difference between correlation and causation, but it's going to be a little while before we actually work with this very, very carefully. Um, and we are going to work with it a little bit more carefully. That's something I'd like you to get out of this course. It might not be listed in the objectives uh, in your syllabus, but it is something I'd like you to have. So, Will we, will we learn the correlations and the causations of like those weird instances of like the bananas and England? Will we know um, the reason why or will we have to research that if we want to know? <laughs> you know, uh, those kind of things I think are going to happen. I mm -hmm. mean, if, if you... If you look at our modern world, and I try and imagine just how much data that even myself, I generate, and it's gotta be tons. I mean, for instance, when I ride my bike, um, you know, I, I track it with my GPS trackers, and that's taking data like every second in terms of my position. And then it turns that data into speed and location, and wow. I get a ton of statistics just out of one ride. And you multiply that by 100 or so rides a year, wow, that's a lot of data. And you know, there's no shortage of data in this world. Computers are great at generating data. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, inevitably, there's gonna be these strange correlations. Uh, there's an NFL correlation that if the AFC wins uh, the Super Bowl, it's going to be a bad year for the stock market, that kind of thing. Well, the stock market and who wins the Super Bowl, I don't think those are related, but yet those correlations do exist. Uh, and if you're, if you're given enough data, you're going to find that kind of stuff. So that, I guess that's where I'd leave my answer is okay. if there's enough opportunity for something to happen, it will. So okay. that's what's going on with those kinds of examples. So but I appreciate the question. I really do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anything else here? All right. So we're going to put a wrap on section 1.1. And I'll stop the recording here.